Series 3, hosted by myself, Michael McGrath. Over the past 25 months, Series 1 and Series 2 have seen 38 guests and personalities from all walks of life, all with stories and knowledge to share, um, all offering valuable insights and all giving of their time in support of uh, the charity. Last month, Series 3 kicked off. Remember, we got 12 new shows for you, so one a month, all designed to uh, inform, uplift, and hopefully entertain a little our community across the UK. But to recap, these shows have three specific goals in mind. Number one, to enable the charity's beneficiaries, uh, children and young people with the muscle wasting disease, muscular dystrophy, and their families feel more connected and less isolated. Secondly, to help the charity reach new audiences in amplifying its work and sharing its impact. And lastly, to inspire much needed donations in support of the charity's mission to deliver 657 amazing muscle dream interventions. That's one cherished, unforgettable, magical moment in time for every muscle in the human body. So if you're tuning in for the very first time, maybe you've got a connection to tonight's uh, VIP guest, uh, maybe design and innovation and accessible products and beautiful spaces uh, is your thing. Or perhaps you're thinking about transforming that tired bathroom, that tired wet room space, but you don't know where to start. Either way, welcome to you all. And as always, to all the mums and dads, the uncles and aunties, the brothers and sisters, uh, the PAs and carers, plus our charity friends and supporters across the UK, welcome once again uh, to you all. So before we kick off tonight's show, uh, a few quick housekeeping points. Firstly, a, a little safeguarding note. As always, we have eyes over tonight's show streaming live on the charity's Facebook, uh, YouTube, and LinkedIn channels. So if any inappropriate comments are observed, action will be taken. And secondly, as always, shows are recorded. So audiences here in the UK, but of course anywhere across the globe can watch previous episodes at their leisure. And as always, the charity would like to invite you all to check out its YouTube channel. Search for DreamMaker657. Don't forget the double M in the middle. That's DreamMaker657 and hit the subscribe button so you can see the impact with many muscle dream films that we hope will encourage you to get involved, perhaps make a donation, and we'll see where we go. Now, if you're a business looking for a charity to adopt, perhaps you've, you've got some innovative fundraising ideas and how to leverage our magic number 657, or maybe we can play a part in supporting your your CSR strategy in some way. Either way, please, please reach out and let's see how we can support your goals and your charitable ambitions. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce uh, tonight's In Conversation with guest. Please give a very, very warm muscle warrior welcome uh, to the founder and CEO of Motion Spot. Please give it up for Ed Warner. Ed, hi, good evening. Good evening, Michael. Great to see you. Yeah, how's it going? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, very well. I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm currently at home in in my house in Acton, West London. Uh, and apologies if you can hear a uh, herd of elephants upstairs. I, I'm, I've just been trying to put three young kids under eight to bed. Excellent. No more excuses this evening. It's really wonderful to have, <laughs> to have you with us tonight, uh, Ed. Um, let me just start off by putting a little, a, little a little note, if you like. So please remember, to those of you that are watching, that if you'd like to say hello uh, to Ed this evening, or you've got a question that you'd like to, to put to Ed, uh, please, please post it on whatever channel uh, you're watching. As I said, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, and one of our volunteer studio team hosts um, will pick it up. So Ed, let's get going. I wanted to kick off by, by asking what you were doing in your world before Motion Spot ever arrived, tell us more. Ah. Well, before I started Motion Spot in 2012, I spent 10 years in 
uh, a various number of sales and marketing roles within fast moving consumer goods manufacturers. So I was at Bristol University. I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. So I studied geography of all things at Bristol. Uh, fell in love with the city, wanted to stay down in Bristol, but couldn't find the job I wanted. So moved to moved to London and started working for uh, Cadbury Sweeps, uh, helping them um, sell and distribute a range of their soft drink brands. I then moved to uh, Nestle uh, for a number of years uh, before finally working for an amazing business called One Water, uh, helping to sell bottled water, um, helping fund clean water projects in Africa. So I wasn't from a design background. I was from a sales and marketing and consumer goods background. Excellent. So let's wind the clock forwards to 2012. Um, how, how did it all come about? So motionspot.co.uk, as you can see on the screen, how did it all emerge? And, and by the way, congratulations on the 10 year anniversary, Ed. Thank you very much. We hit it, hit it in June. So we're, uh, okay. we're looking forward to celebrating. Uh, so really what opened my eyes to this industry and, and what prompted me to leave the job I was in and set up motion spot was the personal experience of an old school friend of mine and our co-founder, James Taylor, who sadly suffered a spinal cord injury in a diving accident, aged 25. Um, James spent eight months in Stoke Mandeville Hospital and then returned to his flat in Battersea, South London to, 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 to live his life as, as an independent wheelchair user. Um, the trouble was he he knew he needed to make some adaptations to his home to, to suit his return. And he sought a range of different advice from occupational therapists and other specialists. And suddenly what was once a beautiful apartment started to resemble something that looked more like a hospital or a clinical care home full of a lot of those products that just no one really wants within their own home. And it was, something he said to me over dinner in 2011 that still resonates with me today and drives the team today. And he said, every morning I wake up and I'm reminded of the products around me because of, it reminded my condition because the products around me. Um, and I'm a big believer that if you get the environment right for people, you can really positively impact cognitive and physical health. So I did what all stupid friends do at that time and said oh let me have a look at the market and i'm sure there's some better products out there and i remember going to speak to a number of manufacturers who you know all said oh you're mad no one no one wants to pay for any of this and no one's interested in design we mm. we get our allocation through the nhs and it's a really nice contract why do we need to spend money innovating product design and i just couldn't understand this because I knew there were a number of people like James who needed it, but also, you know, we're living in a time when people are getting older and wanting to stay in their own homes. Why wouldn't you want this? So, Absolutely. yeah, so I traveled to Scandinavia and realized that, you know, you can blend function and form together. And, and I came back with a much more positive view around what was possible. And, and that was the early sort of form of, of motion spot. Excellent. Now, is James choosing in this evening? I sincerely hope so. Yeah, he's in a similar position to me in that he's got two young kids. Okay. So uh, I think we're in the we're we're in the dreaded sort of kids' bath bed story time uh, witching zone. But but I'm, <laughs> I'm sure come eight o'clock he will be tuning in. If well, not, we'll look, he'll certainly be uh, be picking up the recording. We'll look out for a, maybe a question or a, a little a little a little comment later on from James. Who knows. Um, listen, I'm going to put up, pop up another slide and perhaps you could just, you know, tell us a little bit more about what's going on here because fine and able is how, how where does that sit with the, with motion spot as well? Sure. So when James and I set up the business, we, we started working with people in their own homes and um, that was what we knew. That was what James knew. And we knew we could have the biggest impact of helping transform homes to make them really beautiful and accessible. Uh, we decided to focus on the bathroom in those early days because for so many disabled people, the bathroom is where, you know, you want the greatest independence. It's also sort of where the biggest design crimes tend to happen. So yes. the, the bathroom was our starting point. Um, 
and as our so we started the business motion spot within uh, the bathroom for people at home but actually as our business grew motion spot began to work a lot more with commercial partners with yep. workplaces to help them be more accessible and inclusive with big retailers with uh, hotels that i'm sure we'll talk about a bit later and we realized that actually we had two very different audiences we had people who were running you know these big businesses that wanted the advice as to how to make them more accessible and inclusive and then mm. we had someone at home who wanted that personal service and we felt that actually doing it under one website under one brand was very difficult to do so it was actually the result of covid that that made us launch fine enable so mm. Find Enable is our consumer business. Mm. Um, we relaunched Motion Spot um, uh, consumer side as Find Enable during lockdown because we realized how many people were isolated, vulnerable, at home, living in properties that were just totally inaccessible and unsafe. Um, and created this most amazing brand, built a fantastic team of people who are all hugely knowledgeable about how to design really beautiful, accessible bathrooms. Um, and we were lucky enough to, to, to pick up some, some celebrities along the way who supported us from the early days. So Sophie Morgan, who I'm sure many of you know, and whose career is absolutely going stratospheric at the moment, quite d deservedly, um, was one of our, our first customers. And she's mm. been an amazing supporter of Fine and Able. Brilliant, it's good to hear. Um, why Fine and Able? How did that come about? When was the eureka moment for the name? Oh, it was one of those things in lockdown. We 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 all had quite a lot of time on our hands, and you know, around a virtual sort of branding table, we we had all sorts of different names for the business. Um, and the 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 name came out of uh, I can't even remember who came up with it. It certainly wasn't me. I wasn't that creative to <laughs> to, to come up with the, the the term. But there was something about fine and able that really resonated with me and the rest of the team. It was about how can we how can we create uh, you know environments that people are really proud of. Um, how can we celebrate the fact that 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 you know we can we can help give people independence. We can help you know, people who may be less mobile, um, mm. live independently, safer, mm. longer in the home. And there was something really positive about Fine and Able that I liked. And and it's 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 growing amazingly well um, as, a, as a business and a brand. When I first discovered Fine and Able uh, as, a, as a brand, I instantly thought of Fine and Country. Mm. And, it, it, you know, there are a number of businesses called Fine and Country with variations of, but anyway, it's it's a... It's a lovely thing, and I've enjoyed delving into the into the depths of the website to learn more about about the journey. Um, I'm just going to dive into the chat room, um, Ed, for a, a quick second before we start chatting a little bit more about this image that that Lindsay's just popped up. So, good evening, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and and Ross, uh, very good to see you there this evening with us. Um, you've had a similar conversation with your OT many many times, and I think do you know what, Ross. I think that's the case for many, many people with different types of disabilities, um, having conversations with OTs. And I think there is a, a need as well, um, Ed, in terms of uplifting OTs' knowledge around design and what really what beautiful spaces look like. Um, maybe, there's an, maybe there's a point you'd like to add to that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, OTs do an amazing, they do. Uh, amazing yeah. job. Um, the the trouble is that the the training that OTs receive is very much NHS funded training, and the NHS will give OTs a collection of products that they have to work to. Um, and some of the most you know inspiring days that I have in our business is going out and talking at OT conferences with really experienced professionals who have been doing this 25, yeah. 30 years, and they just come out of it and say, wow, I never, I never knew that was possible. I never knew these products were available. Why, yeah. w why haven't we had this for the last 25 years? So the mindsets are changing, but it's, yeah. it, so much of it is about training and education. So where are you with, in this particular image here, you're with James clearly, but whose bathroom is that? That is actually a hotel bathroom okay. in Dunstable. Um, that was a photo that was shot for the Times about um, three years ago now, and if if James is is on this um, if James is on this session, he will be commenting very soon in the chat box because he absolutely hates 
this photo. Um, <laughs> and we've had uh, we've actually had some recent photography done of us based on the fact that he hates this photo. He hates the fact that um, we're pictured together in a bathroom with me sitting on a loo, um, <laughs> and uh, and he wanted some um, some slightly wider uh, wider wider screenshots of us within. Uh, other environments than than than, than just the Louvre. But we look um, forward to we look forward to seeing the new the new photo exactly. shoot. See the new photo stop coming soon. Excellent, good stuff. So we're going to pop up another image, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the Hotel Brooklyn. And I've got something I wanted to share with you as well. So here's the Hotel Brooklyn. Tell us a little bit more about the journey here. Yeah, Hotel Brooklyn has been an amazing story. So uh, this is a hotel uh, based in Manchester. Um, uh, run by uh, the, an amazing guy called Robin Shepherd, who is a complete visionary in the world of, of disability and design. I know you know Robin well. Um, he had a vision in 2017 to improve the hospitality experience for disabled people. And he ran a competition with the Royal Institute of British Architects to, to really go out to the industry and try and, try and incentivize design studios to think differently about the experience. And, Motion Spot submitted an entry with an amazing architecture practice called Rider Architecture. And we came up with this concept of a, a really beautiful, accessible and adaptable hotel room. We were lucky enough to win the competition in 2017 and Robin turned around to me at the awards and said, right, that's just the start of it. We now want you to go on and design 18 beautiful, accessible bedrooms and bathrooms for us in Manchester, as well as help shape the design of communal areas. So. It, uh, I don't think the photo, uh, we're missing the photo in the top right hand image, which um, is, is a shame. But if I describe what that was, that was a, um, that was a bedroom image uh, of an amazing bedroom where we uh, designed in um, two integrated ceiling track hoists into the bedroom. So, so few hotels in the UK have got ceiling track hoists. And that's because hoteliers believe that you know, it, it um, it's very difficult to sell those rooms mm, unless mm. you've got a guest staying in there who needs a ceiling track course. So I, I think the reason why that image is not shown is because when I looked at it the first time when it came through, um, the ceiling track hoist actually moves. Um, right. So it's like it's a, a moving a, GIF it, file or something. That's our fault. I don't think we've sent you the GIF file, but um, but effectively the, the hoist motor is disguised in a wardrobe. Yeah. So if you were lying in bed, it just looks like a really interesting ceiling light detail. But if yes. you if you needed um, if you needed tracking and, and 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 hoisting from the bed, it's um, available to do that. So this concept of sort of clever dual design features has been designed into Hotel Brooklyn. The bottom left image is an example of of one of the bathrooms. Um, all the rooms have got interconnecting doors. There are clever features like push button call alarms instead of red pull cords that tend to be tied up around grab rails, misused, difficult to clean. Um, and then we got involved in design details like uh, the communal areas. So uh, the um, image on the bottom right is an image of one of the uh, restaurant areas. This is level nine, I think, within the hotel. Um, just promoting good use of natural materials, uh, particularly beneficial for for you know guests um, with a cognitive um, mm. need, in particular mm. neurodiversity, mm. Um, good use of biophilia, lots of natural light, designing you know tables that are easy to access for wheelchair users, you know some of the basics that go with kind of accessible design. But then it's the overlay of all those small points that make the experience such a such a different one for 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 any disabled person. It's excellent. It's so so good to hear that this that, that this um, this progress is being made because it couldn't have come sooner, quite frankly. Because, I mean, I remember twenty years ago, um, uh, you know, doing some work with with Hilton hotels across the UK and Ireland estate, um, and looking very carefully at the sort of the modular setup um, of you know white grab rails and so on. And it's so good to see how design has come into play, how it's evolved. And I think just from the hotel Brooklyn's perspective, I was getting talking to somebody. Um, recently, uh, one of our charity friends who put quite a significant group of um, about, was it about 30, 35 um, in total, of which there are about a dozen, at least a dozen or so power chairs, young people, young adults, all with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is the most severe form. And I asked them to give me a, some feedback on the experience. And they said they were absolutely phenomenal. They bent over backwards and they were so, so helpful and nothing was too much trouble. 
Um, so, you know, we, we were doing a little write up actually because um, it was such a success that particular weekend. So, moving on, let's look at the next slide, please, if we may. So, what's what's going on here? This is uh, a very large office development in Glasgow for Barclays Bank. So we were engaged by Barclays as their um, inclusive and accessible design partner uh, to design a 500,000 square foot office for 5,000 people in Glasgow. This is their flagship of the north. And we worked with an amazing lady called Ron Coghill, who's head of capital projects for Barclays, who uh, has an autistic son and is hugely passionate about improving access uh, far and away be up, uh, above and beyond what minimum standards of building regulations outline. So, you know, if you're designing an office, so many people just adhere to minimum standards and they think about, oh, well, our entrance is accessible because a, a wheelchair user can access that space. You know, as you know, you, you know, only 8% of, of, of disabled people are wheelchair users. So we work with Barclays to to help them design this space to, to suit wheelchair users as well as the 92% of people who may have another physical, cognitive, sensory need, including neurodiversity. So the types of features shown here, um, top right is some of their breakout spaces. Mm -hmm. um, again, here we designed in uh, lots of kind of biophilia, good use of, of plants. We thought about things like the contrast between floors and walls. So for someone with a visual impairment in that space, they're able to define where the floors and walls start and finish, um, mm, which sounds mm. obvious, but so many places have, you know, very similar floor tones that are actually, uh, to wall tones, which are actually very difficult to, to define the space. Thinking about lighting as well is, mm. is hugely important. So making sure you've got the right light source in task areas like um, meeting spaces, the picture in the bottom left is actually a changing places facility. So mm -hmm. Barclays are so progressive that they wanted to put changing places facilities into all three of their buildings in um, in in Glasgow, um, both for employees, but also some of those buildings are open to members of the public. So we were able to to install changing places facilities there. Um, and the picture in the bottom right hand corner is some of their kitchenette space. So mm. so many workplace kitchenettes again. Uh, are designed for 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 people who are standing, um, and you know we designed in um, a space for wheelchair users to access underneath the kitchenettes, uh, long lever taps, um, easy to operate for someone with limited dexterity. Yeah. The kitchen units above have all got drop down baskets that bring the contents of those cupboards towards you. So again, it's the small design features that made such a difference to helping design a really kind of beautiful and accessible space for Barclays. Attention to detail, isn't it? It is, yeah. That's it's the name of the game. Yeah. So Ed, um, goodness me, 30 minutes already through. Can you believe how time flies? Let's go to quick fire round one. Um, so Ed, before we natter some more, a bit of a little bit of a gear change, right? You, you'll, I hope, be familiar um, with our quick fire round. So basically, it's a, a means of allowing our audience to get to know our guests a little bit more. Okay, so Ed, are you ready? I'm ready. Nervously ready. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Scrambled, fried or poached eggs? Uh, scrambled for me. One song that puts Ed in a really, really great mood? Oh, um, Wake Up Boo by the Boo Radleys. Okay. True or false? Uh, the human mind processes visual information. 60 times, sorry, 60,000 times faster than text. True or false? True. Good. Most used emoji on Ed's smartphone? Mm, I like a good clap. <laughs> what, does, what does Tunworth soft cheese with onion relish do for Ed? Mm, salivate. Yeah, I love 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 a ton of soft cheese with a good relish. We should tell everyone this is this is Ed's food heaven, right? So a ton of Tunworth soft cheese with onion relish. Exactly. One item that Ed would take to a desert island. I would take a diary to a desert island. 
what are you going to write in the diary? Do you have the instrument to, I suppose you can use chocolate? Oh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd want to take a pen, I'd call it a journal. I'd call it a, a journal. journal. A journal, a, a journal and pen. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so a Doc M basin is A, 300 millimeters wide, B, 400 millimeters wide, or C, 475 millimeters wide. Ah, uh, that's a good question. I thought you were going to ask me depth. Depth is 250. Sorry, can you run through those again, please, Michael? So 300 millimeter, 400 millimeter, or 475 millimeter? Oh, the design team are going to kill me for getting this wrong. <laughs> I'm going to go B, 400. You're right. Well done. Oh. <laughs> where, where words fail, typography speaks, right? So if Ed was a font, what would Ed be? Mm, I love a good Montserrat font. Good Montserrat, okay. So Ed, you're the PM for 24 hours. One change that you'd make instantly. I would totally overhaul the disabled facility grant system if I was PM. The first color that the human eye reacts to when it comes into vision is A, green, B, blue, C, red, or D, white? I know what the last color is, because that's yellow. Uh, but I would say red. Correct. When Ed is brushing his teeth, does Ed use bamboo, bamboo plastic, or an electric toothbrush? I use an electric toothbrush. So Ed, let's talk briefly about fine and able bathrooms, just for a second, please. So the next image we're about to pop up is a pretty spectacular image. Um, you know, when I look when I look at that, I mean, there's there's a there's a couple of images of beautifully designed bathrooms, right? Just want to pop up. There's two images, Lindsay, and hold on a second. When I think about, for example, our community, okay, so those with muscular dystrophy across the UK who need wet room spaces with ceiling track hoists and 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 so on, how does the economic landscape look? And, you know, we touched on this earlier, didn't we, when we spoke last week or the week before, to what extent can support from, for example, a council with a disabled facilities grant help families if they need to make changes? So, you know, widening doors, I don't know, adapting lighting controls um, and creating, you know, that space. And, and by the way, I think my understanding is correct in that a disabled facilities grant won't affect any benefits that someone receives. Ed? That is correct. So, so the current disabled facility grant system is there in place to help individuals and families to adapt their home um, to suit a, a change of condition or disability. Um, you apply for one through your, your local authority uh, and the local authority does an amazing job with very, very stretched resources to put in adaptations. The, the frustration that I have and the business has with the disabled facility grant system is there is one size that, 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 that sort of tries to fit all within that system. So there is a very limited number of products that can be, can be chosen. Um, and the adaptations are often very clinical and institutional and mm. don't last the test of time um, and can't flex to suit someone's condition as their condition changes. So it's very much the system is is there at the moment to to suit a need, and we yeah. so often see things sort of um, ripped out after they go a relatively short period of time after they go in. Um, the image that you're seeing there is is what can be possible with the right with the right time, with the right planning, and the right resources put into an accessible bathroom. So this is one of Fine and Able's bathrooms. Um, What's interesting about the disabled facility grant system is we have had some local authorities, the more progressive ones, approach us and say, we've got clients that don't want the hospital looking vinyl floor or yeah. the 100 by 100 white tile. Yeah. If we give them the budget allocation we would have spent on their job yeah. and they come to you and either top up that to get a fine and able bathroom or they get some support from a, uh, an external charity or you know, or, or, or look at some other funding, can you help and support? And for us, that is, that's what we'd like to change the system to is a more personalized approach to adaptations where 
people can have personal choice and and have the room and and the home that they want ultimately give me an uh, give me a rough idea of the image we're looking at and then we're going to pop up another image as well in terms of you know what is the reality of having a wet room space like that cost wise just roughly so within that sort of a space the products including tiles lighting if you were to if you were to strip that room back to shell yeah. every, every sort of product that goes in there costs between total cost between four and five thousand pounds yeah the the cost of a wet room so often is is in the installation so it so depends on where you're located in the country because you know, if you're fitting in London and the Southeast versus fitting in in other parts of of the country, the installation costs differ um, significantly. So you could see installation costs coming in at anywhere between seven thousand pounds right the way through to twelve or thirteen thousand pounds. So it, that's the sort of sort of figure that needs to be factored. So installation costs at that level, and then products at four to five thousand. So, so when you sorry, just for clarity, when you talk about installation, you talk about labour cost. It's the labour. It's the builder yeah. to come in and, yeah. and 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 fit that space. Yeah, because, understood. Yeah, you know, to do that, the the work involved is about on average sort of at, at least two and a half, if not three and a half weeks of work. Yeah, it, it's yeah. people people think that that it's a sort of well, we're putting a basin in, we're putting a shower and a loo in. That must be done in a, a relatively short space of time but yep. in order to get it right and to get things like the wall reinforcement right for future fitting of, yep. of grab rails and shower seats um that's the time that's needed but yep. you know we, we see it as an investment in the home this is sure. this is a bathroom that if you were selling that property you know anyone would want in their home and and for us it's about kind of designing accessible spaces that everyone wants not accessible yep. spaces that that um that someone needs in that home for that period of time so the next image just coming up, uh, I mean, again, I was just, I don't know why I was drawn. There were a number of different images here, beautiful images. And I really like this particular one because it's light, it's airy, um, you know, sanitary wear is all white. Um, so again, from an economic perspective, similar sorts of numbers? Similar numbers, yeah. There was actually a bath in this one as well. So we, we do have quite a few clients um, who, who come to us and say, you know, I absolutely need a level access shower because um you know i might be on a mobile commode or i might want to transfer onto a shower seat or i might be planning a shower for future proofing reasons but actually at the moment i really want a bath um and again you know we would work with the individual client to wherever possible within the space to design in what they want the thing when it, when it comes to baths is to make sure that the access to that bath is is absolutely um right and safe so you can't really see it in the image on the right but you know on, on the bars that we supply, you know, we'll always look to put a transfer shelf on the back of the bath to enable someone to sit on that shelf and then through clever positioning of grab rails, be able to transfer themselves into the bath before going back onto a transfer shelf and then back into a, a wheelchair or, or, or use of a frame. We're not a fan of the walk-in bars that, mm. um, you, you know, it, you ask someone to get in and you get cold letting the water you know, rise and it's even worse when you're then wet and you have to wait for all the water to drain before you get out of it. Um, so for us, it's about planning in the right access to suit to suit each individual client. Just going to dive into the chat room just very briefly. Ross, thank you for your observations and uh, yes to changing places. Absolutely agree. Every large employer needs one of these. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic. And the more that people can do to elevate awareness, raise awareness of changing places, they are really excellent spaces. Now, Ed, when I look back at the past 30 years or so where design was and, and where we are today, right? How do you think we're doing, right? You talk about making those with a disability represent, I, I don't know, the 13 or so million people um, in the UK a business priority. And I know that you're also the government's sector champion for the design of products and spaces. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I was I was appointed three years ago as uh, the government access ambassador for for the design of products and spaces, as you said. And you know, my remit as part of that role, alongside running Motion Spot, was to really try and change perceptions around accessible design in the industry. So I set out. I mean, it's a pretty broad title, products and spaces. It encompasses everything. So. 
you know, what I wanted to do at the beginning is was to define kind of two really clear objectives. And for me, the first one was about persuading people to ensure that the design of their spaces was more accessible and helping educate um, individuals and businesses about how to do that. And the second part was about working with manufacturers to ensure they engage more disabled people as part of the product design process, because I was frustrated that so many products are designed by um, traditionally younger people, um, uh, uh, non-disabled people who, who, who might you know, it might involve kind of disabled people as part of a focus group at some stage in the design process. But I really think that disabled people should be involved throughout that design process right the way through to product manufacture and then marketing it. So it's been a fascinating three mm. years in the role. I actually come to the end of the position next month and uh, I'll shortly be kind of writing up my um, my adventures in the role over the last three years. But um but the industry, in answer to your question, is changing, and it's changing much faster now than I've ever seen it in the 10 years that we've been doing what we've been doing. 10 years ago, when James and I were talking to businesses, it was accessibility was still a tick box exercise for them. They were, they were doing it because they sort of knew they had to, um, but we had to drag them to the table often, and, and, and it took us a long time of knocking on doors for those doors to open. In the last two and a half years, we've seen more progress than mm. we've seen in the last, you know, seven and a half years. It has been accelerated as a result of COVID, um, as a result of everyone realizing we're vulnerable, um, everyone realizing the design of our environment impacts our mental health and our physical health, and they've realized that that. You know, there are so many really talented disabled people um, out there in this country and around the world who can work from home and can work in businesses that when they probably couldn't pre-COVID and, and pre, you know, virtual and hybrid working. So it, we've seen a real step change, but there is still a long way to go. We, we, yeah. we feel, you know, accessibility and inclusive design needs to be as big as sustainability. And, and we think we can get it there. Yeah. I mentioned earlier about there being more organizations who get inclusion, right? And who now have strategies uh, that are all about leveraging the, the broad disability market. So with innovative products that are beautifully designed, right? So who do you look for, Ed, for uh, design inspiration? So design inspiration for me comes from a whole a whole range of people you know it, it's it, it's i hope it's not too much of a cliche to say the designers we have at motion spot and fine and able are truly truly inspiring people they they come up with with color schemes with pattern choices with recommendations around putting things together that i would never i would never ever have thought of um, I love I love architecture. You know, I have a real passion for architecture. So, you know, a, a lot of the big, you know, Reba Reba Awards for me. Whoever's winning the latest the, the latest Reba Award, I'll be all over you know their website to try and understand the latest trends, the latest use of materials. Yeah. I'm a big you know believer in use of natural, sustainable materials and the benefits that natural materials in particular can have on health and well-being for people so so a bit of a long answer but a lot of internal inspiration as well as as well as Good. looking to some of our the greatest architects in 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 the uk for that we have a strong design tradition in the uk i was doing some reading around the subject and you know there's so much more thought going into the importance of what people refer to as original thinking and and the value on ideas right when you think about how the design envelope is being pushed, you know, year after year, and by whom. And when I think of design, I think of, I don't know, I, you know, when I was thinking of this conversation this evening, I was thinking about Dyson, for example, James Dyson, and Dyson products. And then I was thinking about Apple, you know, and the joy of unpackaging, you know, your latest Apple phone. Thank you to Jonathan Ive, right? I'm, I'm thinking about Tesla and SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, these are all visionaries, and that was a word you used a little bit earlier. You know, with with also with exceptional entrepreneurial mindsets. So, 
um, you know, 25, 25 years time, let's wind the clock forwards to, I don't know, 2050, right? Where, where will we be at, do you think, on the design journey that you've embarked on? I hope in that period of time, you know, accessible design will just be ingrained in be everything thing. we do. You know, it, it, it seems odd, you know, running a business that's all about providing, you know, the latest, you know, uh, accessible design consultancy and really innovative accessible products. But I hope in 25 years time, there isn't necessarily a need for a specialist company like ours. Everyone is just doing it because they've yeah. realized the, the value in doing so. Um, I see technology is playing a massive role in this space, um, but ensuring that technology doesn't take away the personal, the, the personal interaction um, that, that that goes with our industry. You know, I, I was having a conversation with one of the biggest retirement providers only last week, and they're looking at, you know, what does technology mean for their care business, and are we going to be are we going to be, you know, are we going to be going down the route of robotics for for care in 25 years' time? And I think there's some really interesting developments in that space. Mm. But but actually, you can't. So often, you can't take away that personal interaction yeah. with people. Yeah. But where robotics can come in is for personal care tasks like toileting or 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 or, or other other such personal means where um, where where robots are already beginning to to function in that area. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so in delivering independence for anyone with a disability, how are you seeing that connection between, um, between style and disability? And there's, there's a reason I'm asking that question, just out of interest. How do I see the connection? For, for, for me, the connection is absolute. Like you, you, you can't separate disability and style. Why, why would you have, why would you have an area that is second best in its design look and feel. Um, so what we've been doing for the last 10 years is making sure that everything we do, whether it be, you know, a design principle or a product, as you say, is a Dyson Tesla type product that people can look at and go, wow, we, yeah. we all want that. So for me, I can't separate the two, but interested yeah. as, to, as to the basis of the question. The basis of the question is a bit of a shout out. All right. It's a shout out to a little organization called Blue Badge Style. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, I was judging this morning as part of the Katie's um, Accessibility Award category and having a little little exchange with um, Fiona Jarvis. So I wanted to give Fiona a little shout out if you're tuning in this evening, which I hope you are. Um, Blue Badge Style. If, you don't, if you've never heard of Blue Badge Style, go and Google it, all right? This is an organization that's working really, really hard to, in their words, redefine disability with style. And, and also in Fiona's words, you know, it should be a freedom shared, right? So, um, yeah, just wanted to give a little shout out to Fiona at Blue Badge Star. So, Ed, when we last spoke, I mentioned the DDA, uh, which came into effect in October 2004. And I've watched with great interest how the journey of design has slowly started to become more embedded, okay? In other words, right at the start of the surveying process. Um, and whilst you said there's still a long way to go, you know, do you think we'll get there? I do. Yeah, I really do. Um, it's changed an awful lot since since DDA back in those early 2000s, although it yeah. still infuriates me when architects still say, you know, they phone us up and say, can we have a DDA bathroom from you, please? Um, because what's your, what's your stock reply now to that question? The stock replies, of course you can. Uh, our, our old reply was, uh, well... That our old reply was that well, the DDA was um, was 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 you know it's previously an outdated bit of um, legislation that was upgraded by the Equality Act, yeah. um, which yeah. which which really confused people. So you know we we see um, we see people's understanding improving in this space, but there is a long way to go. And for me, in order to make really tangible change, we've got to, we've got to train architects and designers at the earliest stage around accessibility. You know, architects that study for seven years mm. have maybe an hour's lecture at, at, at most around accessibility, and we wonder why things aren't being designed right. Yeah. And, and that's changing? It is changing. It's changing as designers are realizing that that you can get really creative yeah. and um, 
and they don't have to be you know restricted by um, access regulations. So yeah. the work that we do with designers is to encourage them to think beyond what the access regulation is saying. Yes, the regulation is there to give guidance, but actually through use of color, materials, pattern, lighting, acoustics, you can design really beautiful spaces. Mm. So it's giving giving designers the confidence they know what they're doing. And there are more and more designers who are who are doing it and you know working with us on projects like Hotel Brooklyn and then going on doing their own projects and and learning from it. So it is it is beginning to cascade across the industry. Tell us a bit more about the role that that inclusive design plays in enabling, for example, the the guest service journey be a better one. So you know, I'm referring to a particular industry sector which is close to my heart. And I speak of the hospitality business and specifically hotels, right? So I stay in a lot of hotels. So pre-COVID, we were staying in a lot of hotels. We're beginning slowly to engage, although I'm still being very cautious and vigilant. Um, and I'm always interested um, and observant um, of, you know, what new design elements have been put into a hotel, who's thinking about it, you know, and, uh, you know, that, and, and really the trend, I think, is the, the customer is the one who's applying the pressure because they want for more. And the standards are, you know, the bar is being set higher and higher. So this next image, which is just popping up there, just, just, just chat to me about what that means. What's going on there? Mm-hmm. So the image on the left is a wheelchair accessible toilet or a dock end pack, as it's referred to in the industry. And architects tend to drag and drop the same dock end pack from project to project. We were approached by a private members club in London some years ago now who had that very toilet that was that was their photograph on the left hand side and said, can you just help us design a space that looks and feels like the rest of the club we don't want a second class facility and the picture on the right is exactly the same space using a different set of materials and finishes and it just goes to show that if you think about accessible design at the right stage of a new build or refurbishment project and you have the right product mix in there and you can get creative with the design you can achieve really beautiful spaces that we all want to we all want to use. So yeah, it, we always love that before and after because designers immediately get it and say, oh, okay, I now understand. I can't believe the time is flying. So we're just gonna move on to the next slide. And if you'd like to learn more about either the services being offered by MotionSpot and also Fine and Able, head to their respective websites. And I'm sure that Ed and his colleagues will help wherever they can. And of course, if you just like to say hello to Ed this evening, James, if you're there, hopefully, uh, now's the time, pop your question on whichever channel you're watching um, and we'll pick it up. So, Ed, quick fire round two. Um, you ready? I'm ready. One bit of advice that you'd give your younger self. Hmm. Be more patient. Yeah, I uh, certainly had a tendency of, of uh, certainly in the early years of motion spot of just wanting to go as fast as fast as possible. Um, so, so a bit more patience in those early days. Tonight's dinner, Ed, who cooked it? <laughs> Tonight's dinner was uh, Mr. Hovis and Mrs. Mama. I had Mama and toast uh, just before I saw you, so I haven't had dinner yet. Okay. <laughs> First job that Ed dreamed of having as a kid. Oh, wow. Um, I I first dreamed of, I always wanted to run a retail store to, to be able to, to I, I, I had a, an aunt who was a potter and um, she used, I used to help her sell, sell pots. I used to absolutely love that. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you love or loathe sweet and sour chicken? <laughs> If one was loathe and ten was love, uh, I'm I'm a one with sweet and sour. Most used gadget in Ed's household. Oh, other than the phone, my absolute love at the moment is my fully electric car. If you had to choose just one thing from the following that you're particularly passionate about, Ed, what would it be? A sanitary wear, B, brassware, C, floor and wall finishes, 
D lifts, E ramps, or F hoists? Wow, what a list. Uh, I, out of all those, I'm most passionate about floor and wall finishes because it's amazing the difference that that can make to any space. And if someone was to play Ed Warner in a movie, who would you want it to be, Ed? I would want it to be someone like uh, Christian Bale. Okay. So with some of our past guests, the subject of entrepreneurship has come up. And I wanted to ask you a quick question. What guidance would you give, Ed, to young people, whether they have a disability or not, quite frankly, today? Young people who are perhaps you know, aspiring to start up their own businesses, young budding entrepreneurs. What's, what's, what's the message from Ed to them? My message to any young person setting up a business is, firstly, there's no better time to do it. We've been, we've been through two and a half, three years of absolute turmoil as a country, but turmoil does throw up opportunities. And, and, and I'd say, you know, now is a great time to be, to be looking at starting a business. Um, make sure that whatever you start, you're really passionate about. Um, because there will be days when you'll have amazing highs, but there'll be days when you'll be amazing, you know, unbelievably low. And if you're not passionate about it, it's going to be difficult to get through the low points. Um, and, and persevere, you know, running a business is, is brilliant, but it is, is hard work, but it, 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 you know, so often comes to fruition if you really believe in it, passionate, and you're going to persevere. Good advice. So come on then, let's talk movies. Um, Ed's favourite movies. What's it about these these movies that that you love, Ed? What's going on? <laughs> well, it's only when you flash them up that I sort of realise there there are there are definite themes in here that yeah. um, that that you probably worry about my uh, my general general character. Um, I suppose starting with starting with with Gladiator, Hollywood Hollywood epic. Um, I actually haven't watched it for a while, but I, I remember watching it over and over again. Um, Ridley Scott at his best. Uh, I love love any history, Roman in particular, and I just thought it um, encapsulated some. Well, it was it just an, an amazing amazing film was it, of its time. Um, and Wolf of Wall Street, I, I think a Scorsese classic. Um, Jordan Belfort has demonstrated sort of all the bad about humankind in this film and, and just how greed can totally overcome human beings. But um, there, are some, there are some messages that come out of it. And, you know, I mean, he's been to prison quite rightly for, for fraud, but has come through that and is now, you know, motivational speaking and is, is, is proving that that alpha male culture of excess and addiction um, is 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 hopefully you know behind uh, behind him and 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 behind roles like that in the city. So, you know, uh, by way of a fast-paced movie, I, I I love Wolf of Wall Street. Two massively contrasting films. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Ed's happy place? My happy place is on a holiday, preferably somewhere sunny, uh, with my wife and three children. And uh, in terms of laughing out loud, who makes Ed laugh out loud? Uh, I'd have to say someone like James Corden. Uh, yeah. I laugh out loud too. Um, I, I, you know, consumed an awful lot of Gavin and Stacey. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a big West Ham fan, so anyone who wears a Mark Noble shirt into a Gavin and Stacey uh, episode like uh, James Corden did is, is a fan of mine or, or I'm a fan of. Um, and Carpool Karaoke, he, he continues to make me laugh. So on Dream Dinner Guests, you know, we asked you to name two people alive that Ed would most like to invite to your home and, and why? Uh, so my two dream uh, dinner guests are Cheryl Sandberg, the um, CEO of um, Facebook now Meta. Yep. Uh, I think Cheryl um, has demonstrated an unbelievable, uh, you know, um, she's she's done unbelievable things with that business. Working in what I can only imagine is a, certainly in the early days quite a male-dominated 
culture um and you know through her book lean in which i haven't read but my wife my wife has read and continues to tell me about i think she's just done an amazing job at empowering you know women to be successful and yep. and, and, and be a role model um and my second dinner guest is stephen bartlett um yep. of dragons dragons den fame stephen's only been a dragon for a matter of months but at 29 he brings a completely fresh perspective to Dragon's Den and um, I, I, I love the way he thinks and you know he, he treats business owners with respect and uh, I think he'd be a wonderful dragon. I think one of his attributes is his humility. Yes. Um, which, which is a standout quality. So penultimate question, tell us about a couple of additional goals or, or aspirations that, that Ed wants to achieve in his life. Hmm. Uh, personal ones. Yeah, my, can be or professional. Personal, personal, personal goal professional. is to uh, well, professional goal would be to 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 you know ensure that accessible and inclusive design is as big as sustainability in in 10, 15 years time. I think we can I think we can get it there. Personally, I would um, I'd love to travel into space. Uh, I've promised our five year old son Felix, who's obsessed with 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 everything space at the moment that um some stage i'd love to get in there um it needs to be much more environmentally friendly than burning <laughs> rocket fuel it does but i'm interested to see where elon musk goes with his spacex that's a promise that you have to deliver ed you, you know you, you know this don't you it's tough it's a tough one <laughs> final question to close off tonight's second show in series three ed you've been a, a really wonderful guest if there's just one thing that we can all do to perhaps make the world a slightly better place. What would that one thing be? I would say let's design beautiful spaces for everybody would be my one thing. So big thanks to Ed, Ed Warner for being our guest tonight. And here's my best muscle warrior salute from me to you, Ed. Good man, well done. Now, for those that don't know, that's a, a visible symbol of hope, courage, strength, joy, and unity for all those with muscular dystrophy. Um, this next slide we're gonna pop up. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's show. And do you know what? If you have, please, please, please head on over to musclehulp.com forward slash power of 657 where you can learn more about our £100,000 Power 657 fundraising appeal. Um, you'll see on this page how your uh, donations help the Muscle Health Foundation charity in delivering our muscle dream interventions for children and young people with muscular dystrophy across the UK. So from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you to those of you who decide to make a donation um, this evening. So here we go. Once again, drum roll, breaking news. Um, Monday, the... Um, 30th of May, there's the diary date alert for our next guest, someone who's part of a very, very exclusive club of only two Indian Formula One motor racing drivers, a multiple race winner himself and podium finisher in GP2. Our guest was a, get this, test driver for the Red Bull Racing Formula One team in 2007-2008. And he went on to race in Formula One for Hispania Racing and Team Lotus in 2010 and 2011. And since 2012, he's been competing in sports cars, becoming the first Indian to ever compete in the iconic Le Mans 24-hour race, where he finished in the top six in class at Le Mans in 2012, 2013, and 2015. He joined Mahrinda Racing for all new Formula E series, a historic new championship for electric race cars for the inaugural season in 2014, 2015. He's built a strong reputation as a commentator and analyst for motorsport, working with five different global Formula One broadcasters from BBC Radio 5 Live, Channel 4. And since 2019, he's been a part of the Sky Sports F1 team, who, as all of you I'm sure know, broadcast to 62 countries around the globe. He's worked with the likes of Guy Martin, is a regular on Fifth Gear, and he's also worked with Jeremy Clarkson. So there's much more to say about this next guest. So you'll have to tune in. And I'll be delighted to introduce you all to this gentleman. And as you can see, if you have a love of all things to do with F1 and motor racing, I promise you, you won't want to miss this particular episode starring 
Karen Chantok. There it is, Monday, the 30th of May. There's the diary date alert. Do please join our third in conversation with broadcast in our series three with Karen Chantok. Once again, on behalf of the Muscle Foundation Charity, my thanks to tonight's guest, Ed, Ed Warner. Thank you so much. Thank and you. To thanks. Our, thanks, Michael. And to our volunteer StreamYard studio team, to Steph and to Kate. And a special note of thanks to tonight's uh, studio lead, to Lindsay, for once again making it all happen behind the scenes. For now, have a great rest of the week. Bye bye.